This is Arroyo Live. The purpose of this program is to help restore a sense of connection within our community through open and meaningful conversation during this time of social isolation. To that end, we are live if you're watching on Tuesday, May 26th, and there'll be an opportunity to call in with your questions later on in the program. Tonight, we're hoping to explore some of the ways the COVID-19 pandemic has affected the roles of some of the hallmarks in the city of Pasadena. And with that in mind, we have guests from two of the largest operating communities, com, I'm sorry, two of the largest operating companies within the city. The third being our parent company, Pasadena Community Access Corporation. So joining me this evening are Mr. Daryl Dunn, CEO and General Manager of the Rose Bowl and uh, Mike Ross, CEO of the Pasadena Convention Center. Gentlemen, how are both of you doing this evening? Great. Nice to talk to you, Joe. Yeah, Joe, Thank thanks you. for having us. Thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, not to put you on the spot, but I'm going to put you on the spot. And I'm hoping that each of you gentlemen would take a moment to let our viewers at home know a little bit more about you. Daryl, I think we'll begin with you. Sure. Um, well, I am... I've been at the Rose Bowl a long time. And seen, this is, I started there in 1995. I became the general manager in 1999. So it's over a 20-year run. And it's certainly, it's been a game changer. Uh, at, before past, before the Rose Bowl, I was worked with multiple stadium, um, sorry, multiple teams in L.A. I worked for the Lakers. I worked for the Clippers. I worked for the Raiders. And when they were in L.A., I worked for a World Cup. And after World Cup, one of the benefits of the World Cup is I got to know some people in Pasadena, and after World Cup was over, I came over and and it was a game changer for myself and my family. I've been here since. It took me a long time to finally realize I should move to Pasadena, and I did that this past December. Uh, and I'm living over between PCC and Caltech, and I'm very, very proud Pasadena resident, and I'm happy to be here tonight. Well, again, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Mike, it's now your turn. Great. Well, as mentioned, I'm Michael Ross. I'm the CEO of the Pasadena Center Operating Company, and we manage um, the convention center, obviously the Civic Auditorium, the Pasadena Ice Skating Center, and the Convention and Visitors Bureau. I've been here for, it's coming up on 15 years. I came here in 2006 with the um, idea of building at the convention center and then uh, becoming the CEO of the corporation. So uh, just like Daryl mentioned, you know, um, I've been around a long time. Uh, I've got about 30 years with experience and I worked and ran the convention facilities in, uh, in Sacramento and then uh, San Jose and then uh, came down to Pasadena in 2006. And like Daryl, I live and work in the city and love it. Well, it is clearly safe to say that both of you gentlemen are very, very accomplished in your respective fields. And that's wonderful. We, we thank you for joining us on the program this evening. We thank you for your service to the community. Uh, and that would bring me to my very first question, which is how the COVID-19 pandemic and all that has happened, you know, as a result of it, have affected you directly. Um, since I guess we, we started off the introductions with Daryl. Mike, I'm going to throw this one at you first. Well, I think I've been affected like everybody's been affected. You know, um, uh, obviously, um, all of the social distancing, the different cleanliness, the fact that you've got to wear a mask, the fact that uh, people are trying to work from home. I'm trying to work at work. I'm trying to work from home. You know, it's been difficult. But I think that um, how it's affected me is obviously there's a lot more communication that's needed in terms of of all of the social media and all of the, you know, phone calls and how we communicate with staff and how we communicate, you know, something like your show. It's, it's a perfect opportunity to get the word out. But I think my life has been affected just like everybody else's. It's been very difficult. Daryl, have you seen uh, any, any radical uh, uh, change in the way that uh, your personal life has been affected as a result of this? Well, Tomorrow, um, our son, who just graduated from Whittier College, or sorry, sorry, he just finished Whittier College this semester, um, thought he was going to have a job and was still live in Whittier, but he's moving home uh, because jobs aren't so plentiful. Our other son had a few jobs. He went on a three-week 
whitewater river rafting excursion in the Grand Canyon, and he had no idea what was uh, gonna what he was gonna find when he landed. And he found that the pandemic hit, and he's also out of work. Um, so it does certainly hit close to home, and it's affecting so so many people all around the world. Well, how has this affected business for each of you in your respective locations? Well, I mean, from the convention center standpoint, we closed all the facilities mid-March. So um, the convention center, the civic auditorium, and the ice rink. So we went from being very busy to not having any events, and that's how it stands today. We um, we're, we've closed the convent, or we've we've closed all three facilities, but we also closed the ice rink and took the ice out. So from that standpoint, it's been difficult. We've had a, obviously a lot of cancellations. We've had a lot of postponements, but hopefully, you know, down the road, we'll be able to bring those folks back. And on the Rose Bowl side, the Rose Bowl operating company, who I work for, they're the group that manages both the Rose Bowl and Brookside Golf Course. Uh, similarly to, Mar- to Mike, you know, um, when it hit, you know, it just stopped. You know, we have a lot of events at the Rose Bowl. You know, big ones, not as many, you know, 15 to 20. But small ones, we have about 300 events a year. So we just, that stopped entirely. Our flea market, which has been going on for 51 years, had its first ever cancellations. That happened. The golf course was closed down. Fortunately, it brought, got brought back up. Um, you know, we have a lot more outdoor space than the convention center has. So we're still hopeful that we're going to have some opportunities to do some things. So our staff is working diligently trying to pr- provide, you know, what, what will events look like during COVID because of the social distancing and the sanitization and all that goes along with it. So we're trying to put a lot of procedures in place so that when we get the green light that we can start doing some things, we're going to be ready to get back to work. Okay. So obviously things have come to a standstill for the moment. Um, are, are there, are there long-term recovery plans in place for, for both of your facilities? Uh, you know, at some point when we do get a chance to, to move nearer to normal, um, do, do you have a, a hopeful outlook somewhere down the road? Yeah, absolutely. We're very positive with uh, our business. And, you know, when when events have canceled, um, as, as I mentioned, you know, March, April, May, as we go into June, you know, we do have a lot of business on the books, you know, October, November, December, January. And so if once we can uh, get to the point where we can open up, even if it's for smaller events, and then those continue to grow. But our hope is by, you know, say January, February, that we can be up and running, uh, and we'd be very busy. And, and it's very, very similar on our end too. Uh, you know, the obviously we're based upon a lot. We have our football tenants, you say, in terms of roses. And those decisions will, in terms of what their activity is going to be this fall, that will be decided by the Pac-12 conference and the college football leaders around the country in coordination with the public health officials um, locally here. But you know, as we look to it also, we think, for example, we do quite a bit of music. And right now, there is no musician able to make a, make a living because they can't play anywhere. We do believe once there's a vaccine and once you know society sort of gets uh, accustomed to this and, and figure out whatever the appropriate protocols are that there will be an opportunity to do a lot of business from that perspective it's because we think people are going to want once they feel safe people are going to want to go out be around each other sort of you know get back to where it was before you know a hundred years ago there's a reason things were called the roaring 20s well we think the roaring 20s are coming back and it's going to be a lot of fun. We just got to wait it out a little bit. Well, we have seen some of the restrictions on some businesses uh, are finally beginning to be relaxed. And of course, uh, that's always come down with the caveat that if we suddenly see a, a major resurgence in the, the level of infections or, uh, heaven forbid, the deaths, uh, that, that they might have to clamp down again. But assuming that we get to continue with the gradual reduction in restrictions, 
Uh, I, I know that major event facilities are, are sort of the last to get the go ahead to open up, but uh, pres presuming that they continue with social distancing, how does that affect your operations uh, moving forward? I mean, how do you work with social distancing? Well, in our case, um, probably not unlike the Rose Bowl, we just have a smaller venue than say the Rose Bowl, but you know, how many people are we gonna be able to get in to a 3000 seat venue? You know, and it goes back to, you know, we hear a lot of stories about the fact that, well, maybe it'll be 20%. Well, the question is, can anybody sell enough tickets when you can only get 20% of the people in your venue? No different than the ice rink. If I can't get, you know, the 800 kids back for lessons, I say me, our, our team, then, you know, how do I do, how do we make any money and how do we make it affordable for anybody to open up with 20%? 20% yeah, model is going to be difficult. That, that's really the big question is, can you be uh, uh, cost effective if you have to uh, reduce or dramatically reduce the number of people that can be in the venue at any one time? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things that we've looked at, uh, you know, groups have contacted us and said, hey, we're at a very small venue but now we need a little bigger venue. We're at an 800 seat, a thousand seat theater. And we're getting those calls and say, hey, if we had the social distance, could we move into your 3000 seat theater? The answer is absolutely. You know, again, we work with a lot of television events. Can they come in and produce a television show um, without audiences? So again, a lot of unknowns. And as you know, everything changes daily. That is so very, very similar to yeah, very similar to, to Mike. The Rose Bowl is in, a, um, in this same situation. You know, once again, we have a lot of outdoor space. We do quite a bit of it. We call them enterprise events, much smaller. Could be a corporate event. Um, could be you know just some kind of celebration of some type. We're hopeful that those kind of events can be brought back soon. Again, we are. We do have a lot of inquiries out there, and we what, what our team is working diligently on is our operations are changing dramatically because now we have to go in and make all the different protocols in place because of COVID-19 and everything that goes along with it. So our team right now is working probably as hard, if not harder than they ever have, just in a different role because really now our venue has dramatically changed and we want to and expect that we're going to have opportunity to do some type of business and we just want to be ready to go. So among the, the requirements for most of the businesses that have been or are being allowed to reopen uh, in, the, in the near term, uh, the, the constant cleaning and sanitizing of, of all the facilities is a major uh, hurdle that they must overcome. Can you gentlemen talk a little bit about how you handle those processes uh, in your respective facilities? Well, I know at the convention center, um, as Daryl mentioned, we're all putting together protocols and there's a number of associations out there that we all belong to. And, you know, obviously the city has their own health department. We've got the state, we've got LA County. At the end of the day, I think we're, we're all going to come to a very good set of protocols. And then the idea is, you know, you've got to implement those and cleaning, sanit sanitizing everything is going to be one of them. You know, um, you know, how, how do you, you know, you sanitize a, 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 a door, uh, a door that you're opening constantly with people. I mean, how do you do that? If you look at how the grocery stores are doing it, certainly we're going to, you know, our masks required. If that's something we're going to have to have, you know, people are going to have to wear masks. If social distancing, how we set up the rooms, how, uh, how we clean. You know, there's lots of different, I mean, cleaning products alone now, you know, what actually kills the virus? So there's a lot of unknowns at this point. But I think, as Daryl said, we've worked to have plans together. We're working with the city and, you know, we'll be ready to go uh, when the time comes that we can open up. But again, are we going to be opening for 10 people? Is it going to be 20 people, 20 percent? You know, until you get down the road. It's really hard because the protocols that you set up today will change tomorrow. Yeah, and, and 
Uh, Mike, you, your facility is largely an indoor facility, and that presents its own challenges, as you were discussing, when it comes to, to keeping things sanitary. But uh, Daryl, yours is largely an outdoor facility, and that's got to present an awful lot of unique challenges in the area of, of sanitizing. So how will you be coping with that? But we're fortunate, as Mike talked about, there's a lot of resources that are available. We're trying to take advantage of every single one. You know, the city and the city's health department, of course, at the top of the list. But we're involved in a multitude of task forces. I mean, one that we're involved with is with every event, every sports venue and every sports team in Southern California. And we're taking best practices from as far from as from Asia. Um, we are just looking and learning. Um, and this is not a Pasadena specific problem. It's a global problem. So as we look through it, what are the best practices? What are the solutions out there? Are the cleaning uh, company that we contract with, you know, they're all over the nation as well. What are they recommend? So we're just working hand in hand. And then ultimately we'll do, we'll put those new protocols in place, you know, provide them to the city's health director, explain to them our thinking and processes, because we all want the same thing. We all want people to come, but we want them to come in a safe environment where they feel good and we're going to do everything we can and we, to make sure that happens. All right. Well, uh, it's interesting. You, you mentioned a safe environment, uh, sort of building on the idea of the whole uh, probability of continued social distancing and the need for continually sanitizing. Um, this past weekend was a holiday. It was the Memorial Day weekend. And there were certainly a lot of reports in the news about people flocking to the beaches. And though here in California, the, the standing rule still is that uh, you're supposed to continually be moving on the beach. It was open for exercise, but not for sunbathing. We certainly saw a lot of people that were basically disregarding a lot of those uh, safety concerns and rules. And one of the big ones was that while everyone was supposed to be wearing a mask, it seems that very few people were. Do you see that as being an issue in either of your venues when the time comes to reopen? Sure. I think, um, you know, could it be an issue? I mean, as you mentioned, it was an issue this weekend. Um, but I do think that our situation is a little different. Um, and, and I would suspect the Rose Bowl is too, in the sense that people aren't running to the beach, right? They're coming to a meeting, they're coming to a specific event, and the event will have some rules. And the idea is, is that people would follow those rules. You know, if we have a conference, and the conference has is, let's say we had to open and it's a 1000 people, well, they're going to have their own, you know, somewhat rules and regulations that they're going to expect their um, attendees follow. And of course, we're going to work with them on the same sort of procedures that here's what's expected once you arrive. So, you know, at, at some point, you know, adults have to also take responsibility for themselves. We're going to put things in place, but I don't see us being like the beach where it's just, you know, thousands of people rushing down to get in the sun. Really the, the key, I, I, we believe, is communication. You know, and technology, one of the benefits of technology was our ability to communicate with the people coming to your events because pretty much now these days with you know the way ticket sales are and even or conference registrants or what have you you pretty much know who's coming to your event in advance so you can communicate very clearly what the expectations are it has happened differently you know after 9 11 events were very 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 different and we need to educate the public educate the community on the do's and the don'ts and what's expected to come into our venues. And I think that communication piece is going to be critical for not just our businesses, but for any business to open up. And people are responsible for the most part. They will listen for the most part. There's always exceptions to the rule. But for the most part, people want to be safe and they just want to have a, a good time and some good experiences. And we want to help provide that for them. One of the... the things that I imagine is uh, uh, probably a little bit more challenging for the both of you is that unlike a conventional small business owner, each of you happens to uh, 
be running a an operating committee of the city. And so do you feel that there's a greater challenge or expectation uh, to to put more safety protocols in place or be stricter with the enforcement of those rules when the time comes? Uh, I'll, I'll take that one a little bit. Um, you know, it, those rules apply to everybody. It doesn't have to be public or private. It's just society. And, and so whether it's the you know, convention center, the Rose Bowl, or a, good, a restaurant in town, or a shopping center, or a grocery store, you know, that is now the standard. And it's up to the businesses and people to uh, make their adjustments in their life, just recognizing the situation they're all faced with. It's a responsible thing to do. And I think for the most part, people are responsible. Yeah, I would agree with Daryl. Um, I really do. I, I, I don't know that there's a big difference between, you know, a, a, a public organization like ours who has public events and a restaurant. I think that, um, um, you know, all the protocols are going to be in place. And I think that they'll all be somewhat the same. They'll be consistent. All right. Um, so now I want to switch gears just a little bit in that, uh, both of you are, are running very, very large organizations, and, and there are clearly a lot of staff uh, behind those operations. How has this affected your staff? Um, with everything coming to a standstill, uh, what has happened to all of the, the people who are charged with, with making each of your facilities a success when things are normal? Well, unfortunately, um, we have had some layoffs. And the idea behind that was, well, first off, anybody and everybody who can work from home is working from home. Um, we still have a lot of people, myself included, who come into the office often. But first off, people were working from home. Anybody who was 65 and older, we sent home. Um, and then as we paid people through the month of March and all of April and part of May, it, it became clear that we're not gonna open anytime soon. And so we did have to have some layoffs. It was difficult, um, but the idea is, is that we will get people back to work as soon as business allows, as soon as we can open, as soon as we start to get some business. I'll give you an example. It's like the um, ice rink. When you close the ice rink and now you've taken the ice out of the ice rink, it's really hard to figure out something to do with the folks who work at the ice rink. So there were a couple of people that unfortunately got laid off. But the minute we put ice back in, we need those people. So that's our goal is to get everybody back to work and to, you know, come, you know, whether it's November, Oct October, November, whatever date it is, it's, you know, we hope to ramp back up very soon. Right. Daryl, I know you're us, in a situation. Yeah, we are. Um, every, you know, uh, almost everybody's in a similar situation right now, it feels like. You know, um, as Mike talked about the ice rink, I guess our golf course is similar to the ice rink, you know, where we had to go in and essentially, with the exception, I think two or three people, everybody had to get laid off for a bit. But fortunately, golf's back up. I mean, you know, people are back to work, um, which is great. You know, we're a very lean organization. And as I mentioned, it's going to be such a drastic change for us operationally on how we conduct ourselves. So we are working, we call them, you know, SOPs, Standing Operating Procedures. We're working on a, every SOP you can imagine for different scenarios and different models and how we're going to do things because it is our intent and our hope that we are going to be getting back to business maybe differently than we were before. But we are working, we have our sales team working, trying to drum up business, both short-term, long-term. We have a foundation. Their staff is working. They got a couple significant gifts last week. So um, we're still uh, swinging the bat and plugging away in a very challenging time. And we are looking forward to the day that everybody can get back in the office and we can just get back to some kind of normalcy. Yeah, Daryl has an excellent point. Uh, you know, our sales team um, at the Convention and Visitors Bureau and at the Convention Center are still working. Um, they're primarily working from home, but the idea is to, I mean, first off, when you have, you know, 70 events postponed, 
and or canceled. So they're moving further out. It's finding dates, working with each one of those clients. The fact that we still see, we book a lot of business two and three and four years out. So we've got a lot of conventions, you know, in the pipeline. And the idea is to continue to sell our business. You know, it's like anything, it's perishable, right? We can't sell, you know, yesterday, yesterday is over. It's time to keep moving forward. And that's what we've done. All right. Uh, before I move into the next question, uh, it amazes me how quickly the time goes by when we're having such a wonderful discussion. Um, however, we have actually reached about the halfway point of the show. And as I promised our viewers at home, there would be an opportunity for anyone who would like to uh, perhaps call in and, and voice any questions or concerns that they might have regarding this evening's topic. And so our phone lines are now open. The telephone number to call is area code 951 356 6882. That's 951 356 6882. But a quick reminder that this show is only live if you are watching on Tuesday, May the 26th. If you are watching at another time uh, via on demand or uh, somewhere uh, on our web page, uh, then there's a good possibility we're not live. And uh, so there won't be anyone to answer the telephone. All right. Uh, moving back into our discussion, gentlemen. Um, one of the things that I was hoping to do was to uh, kind of change up the uh, the topic a little bit again. And as I alluded to at the top of the show, discuss some of the things that your facilities are doing to aid the public during this pandemic. Um, with that in mind, Mike, I know that uh, there was discussion about taking sections of the convention center and turning them into overflow uh, hospital facilities. How has that worked out? You know what? It's worked out well. And I want to congratulate the city of Pasadena, Pasadena for getting on top of it early. Pasadena, the city of Pasadena and Huntington Hospital worked long and hard, but quickly to figure out what would happen if the pandemic spread. And so um, working with um, a company called Red Rock Entertainment, we were able to uh, work with them, with our staff, with Huntington, with the city, and set up a 250 bed. Uh, uh, temporary care facility, a temporary hospital. And so we've been set up since uh, about the second week of April. And we anticipate, we're being told that that will last through the end of June. So the idea was almost three months of a facility that just in case there was overflow needed from Huntington. And, you know, thank goodness for all of us, it has not had to be used. And so the idea is, is that the city got on it in time and, uh, you know, we're ready to go in case there is a situation. Now, your your facility was set up to handle uh, patients that were not infected with COVID. Is that correct? You, you would be they would basically evacuate the hospitals of patients that were not infected uh, in favor of freeing up those beds for the people that might be critically ill. Was that the plan? Well, you know, there was discussion both ways uh, in terms of, you know, would we be better, or would our facility be for COVID patients? And there was a plan in place if needed. For instance, cleaning would be a lot different, right? If we had COVID uh, patients in the facility, we then at that point, we engaged Huntington Hospital and the company they use for cleaning and said, look, this isn't something that we can do with our staff, right? We're not um, infectious disease, you know, cleaning folks. So at that point, you know, the game changed, but there was talk both ways. Would we be for patients in Huntington so they could treat the critical or would we actually be set up for COVID? Um, okay. So then I just have to ask what, uh, was there, was there like a plan A and a plan B, and if so, which was plan A, to have the, the COVID patients or the non-COVID patients? Uh, probably to have the COVID patients, because obviously that was the, um, uh, you know, if that was the case, it takes a lot more work. I mean, it's all a lot of work, right? To, to move patients, to put them into a temporary care facility, to bring on all of the doctors and nurses and everything that goes along with it. But obviously, having COVID patients um, would, would, would have been more problematic. 
And the other thing too is, you know, once you get COVID patients, you know, we had clients call and say, if you're set up for a hospital with COVID patients, what are your procedures to make sure the facility is going to be safe when we come in in a month or two months or three months? So a lot of questions with that. Yeah. Uh, and would you have accepted or, or obviously you, you're still in that phase where you could uh, accept patients in an overflow situation. Would they come strictly from medical facilities within the city or were you set up to take uh, patients from just about anywhere in the county if need be or even perhaps a larger area? We were set up strictly through the city of Pasadena and Huntington Hospital. So the, it, it's my understanding that any of our patients would have come through Huntington Hospital in Pasadena. Well, we certainly thank you for being uh, ready, willing, and able to, to take on such a task. Um, and then, of course, Daryl, uh, it's my understanding that with, with the very large uh, real estate that, that your facility has at its disposal, you have opened up uh, the lots for COVID testing uh, in, in a remote setting so that people can come up or basically drive up in their vehicles and not have to risk exposing anyone else uh, while they, they get tested. Is that correct? Correct. And that's exactly right. The Rose Bowl, we're a well-known destination. People know where we are. We have the space. Um, so it has been successful. We have a lot of people go through there and get tested, which is great. Um, and we've also, uh, another of our parking lots is being utilized by FEMA for some trailers. And they're, once again, they're available if and when they're needed. And the other thing that both um, the convention center and the Rose Bowl are working together with the city is you know, we're helping with meals mm -hmm. for um, the, you know, for, for, in, we're doing with PUSD on the weekends. It's wonderful that every week uh, our staff asks for volunteers and they're always full and it's going out there and people are really appreciative because people are having a hard time right now. You know, uh, both of our caterers and our in instance for both ourselves as well as the convention center have stepped up and people have really tried hard to do what we could. And it actually feels really good to know you're trying to help some people who need the help. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Excellent point that Daryl had. Um, we've been, we, um, there's seven schools in Pasadena and we service four and the Rose Bowl service is three. We each do 1,550 meals every Saturday and Sunday, providing lunch for PUSD students. Right now we're at about 21,000 meals served. So the Rose Bowl has got to be about the same because we do the same each weekend. And uh, it's wonderful. We also are working with the Shower of Hope. And also there's a motel program in town where we're serving some meals. So as Daryl said, it's a wonderful program. It keeps, um, it's keeping our catering staff busy. Uh, and it, it's a give back to the community. We're able to provide, like Daryl said, a lot of volunteers, a lot of people. We've had a lot of staff members, about a thousand hours of staff working on it and distributing meals. So yeah, it's a wonderful program. Well, Daryl, as uh, as I mentioned with Mike earlier, thank you so much for uh, you and all of your staff for, for the wonderful service to the community. We certainly do appreciate it. Uh, we also have a question sent in by one of our viewers, and he was using the Facebook chat. Um, and this this ties into the Rose Bowl again. And, and Daryl, as you said, the fact that it's known around the world for so many things. Uh, but Daniel was wondering what, has happened or what will be happening with the famous flea market that was held so often at the Rose Bowl? We'll be back. Uh, we're just waiting. We're, we're waiting. Um, you know, a few flea markets have opened up around the state and uh, we're just waiting and we're looking forward to the day that the flea market comes back. It's, you know, if, if it's unbelievable how popular it is. Uh, so certainly some pro protocols and procedures are going to be, be put in place before it opens back up. Um, but we're excited, and the day that opens, that'll be a really good Sunday. We're looking forward to it. So how many special events have been put on hold now uh, at each of your facilities? And, and maybe what are, what are some of the highlights that we, we are unfortunately missing so far this year as a result of this? Well, in terms on, uh, I'll just, you know, we have a lot of smaller events that are really cool. Um, that one of my favorites was uh, Masters of Taste, 
which is a, a great event we have on the field, if anything, in Union Station, and it's the best food anywhere you can get. So that was one of my personal favorites, but we've had uh, some big concerts. Fun. Yeah, for sure. Uh, but a band called BTS, which is a, a, a biggest K-pop band in the world, they were supposed to be playing three nights earlier this month. Um, this weekend, it's supposed to be Justin Bieber. We're supposed to have that. Uh, and, and of course, as mentioned, the flea market, we've been missing that. And, you know, they had a heck of a run. They never missed one in 51 years. Uh, the flea market operated in any kind of weather you can imagine. It operated even during the World Cup. But um, unfortunately, it has uh, once again not been another victim of this virus. So there's been plenty, uh, but we're looking forward to getting back in action. All right, Mike, I'm going to throw that same question at you um, just so that we can keep all of these wonderful events fresh in everyone's mind so that as soon as things get back to normal, they can remember to go look for these these wonderful events again. Sure. Well, you know, we started out with uh, 28 tapings of America's Got Talent and they got through 24 of them. And then, you know, we had to cancel four shows there. Um, interesting enough is that the show still has not moved out because it's been on lockdown, so that's something we're waiting for them to do, uh, and they're working on that. Um, you know, let's just look at graduations alone, right? We do 30 graduations a year, and all 30 of them got canceled. So, you know, that really impacts the community because, you know, people want to come out. They want to, they want to go to their graduations. They want to see their, you know, their child or their grandchild, you know, graduate. So that's been a problem. Uh, you know, we've lost about 70 events so far, which is about $2.2 million. So it's been devastating. And, you know, let's face it too, you know, our hotels are way down because we just don't have travelers in town. And as Daryl mentioned, you know, if, if they have got a BTS show or they've got a Justin Bieber show, it's a big weekend in Pasadena. And we're happy to promote and happy to bring clients and show them our Rose Bowl and fill up our hotels and fill up our restaurants. So everything's kind of tied together. You know, we all work together to make Pasadena successful and make it busy. And, and events do that. We know that events really drive a lot of business in Pasadena. And it's been a it's been difficult. Well, Mike, I have to tell you that I read your bio prior to coming to do the show this evening, and I never saw anything in there about your mind reading abilities, but apparently you possess them because you, you really kind of touched on about my very next question, which was going to be exactly how devastating has the loss of revenue been? Uh, and I guess I'll broaden the scope, not, not only for your particular organization, but but for, and, and granted, this is going to call for a little bit of speculation, but but to the city in general, how devastating has this been financially? Well, well, as every community, the hospitality industry is probably the hardest hit. I mean, and when I say hospitality, that could include our hotels, that could include our venues, our museums, it could include any attractions. Obviously, our restaurants are devastated. The fact that our retail is devastated. So everything is down and it's all tied together. When we have visitors, they eat, drink, shop, spend the night. So everything is connected. And it's, uh, you know, our, our great weekends are when the Rose Bowl is busy, as I mentioned, you know, when we're busy on an off weekend that the Rose Bowl isn't, you know, having a big event. When they've got the, the flea market, we might have something, you know, there's a lot going on. And we're just two venues. There's a lot of venues in Pasadena that are doing the same thing. So, yeah, it's been tough. Our hotel business is off by about 80 percent, which is really difficult. You know, the hotels are just, you know, they're down. Our restaurants, you know, we're finally open for curbside and hopefully soon we'll be able to open up, you know, with very small crowds. But we've got to get the economy moving. And that's the way to do it is to get things back open and get people coming back out. Carol, I'd like to I'd like to send that same question over to you about how devastating this has been financially. Well, Mike really answered it um, for the totality, but with the Rose Bowl side, uh, we project 10 to $15 million from this uh, as a loss. So it is you know, clearly a devastating, something we've never, ever seen before or contemplated. 
and it's um you know it's, the near term effects of this are very obvious but but what about the long term effects of of a you're talking about probably the loss of almost a year's worth of revenue so what does this do to each of your businesses over the long haul is this something that can be recovered relatively quickly when things get back to normal does it uh, obviously it becomes more devastating the longer this lasts i mean if if we have to remain isolated into next year what happens in the long run well, I guess that's the question, right? You know, um, and we've all been, you know, projecting and taking a look at our business. And like I said, each month, you know, we're canceling more and more events and we're moving out. We're at 70 events canceled at this point. As it goes on, you know, there's about 30 events a, a month that are canceling. So it's, um, you know, it's difficult. Uh our fiscal year ends June 30th, the city's fiscal year, the Rose Bowls. We end June 30th. We're going to be fine through June 30th, but the question you asked is next year. And next year is the difficult one, right? Because, you know, if, if we don't get up and running full force until, say, January, February, you know, it's a, it's a half year loss. It's a big, big loss. So, you know, we'll have to wait and see. But um, we're we're projecting being down significantly, uh, but we'll bounce back. I think everybody will bounce back. Well, I, I have to I have to throw this one at you, uh, both of you gentlemen. Um, there was a phrase that that was used rather heavily during the economic meltdown back in 2008, 2009, and that was too big to fail. Both of your operations are really iconic in the city of Pasadena. So um, without without really trying to put you gentlemen on the spot, would you both characterize your respective operations as too big to fail? I mean, I don't think you can take anything for granted. And I think we have to be smart. You have to be strategic. You have to communicate. You got to plan for the future. Um, so I don't think anybody is too big to fail. Yeah, you know, I think you need to prepare yourself to succeed. And that's what we're trying to do. Yeah, I think uh, that's a great answer that Daryl had. You know, we have to look to the future. And by looking to the future, what is it that we can do today to be better tomorrow? And what can we do? And every day, just keep moving forward. And, you know, we'll come out of this crisis. You know, in 2009, you know, I got here in 2006, and in 2009, we opened the convention center. So we built the convention center at the most expensive time in the history of California, and we opened up at that time at the worst time in the history of California. Now, today's worse, right? COVID is worse than the big downturn in the economy, but, you know, it took us a good couple of three years to dig out of that hole. And I think the same thing is going to happen now, because once we get busy, we've got a lot of business on the books. The last half of uh, two, 21, 22, 23, we're going to be back. The Rose Bowl is going to be strong. And, you know, it's getting through this half year to a year problem. And then once we get from there, I'm optimistic that we're going to have a great run in Pasadena, just like we have for the last seven, eight years. All right. Well, that is uh, very good to hear because um, certainly, as I say, uh, both of your facilities are icons within the city and, and beyond. So, uh, you know, certainly uh, something that we want to see in the future. Um, to that end, have you gotten uh, assistance or been able to get assistance from uh, the state? or perhaps at the federal level, or even from the city during this difficult time? Well, you know, on that, you know, we're owned by the city. We're both owned by the city. So we get assistance from the city every day in some manner. And so the city's, you know, that, that's a given. The feds and the state aren't quite as simple, in part because we are owned by the city. And so if there's opportunities, it really does go through the city in those areas. Uh, but, you know, a lot of the programs that have been involved um, are, have up till, up till now have not necessarily been for municipal organizations like ours. They've been more for, you know, the private companies and some nonprofits. So we've looked at a lot, quite a, you know, quite a number of them we haven't been eligible for, 
Uh, but we're working, I think you know, we have some more calls with the city tomorrow just to strategize and talk about what our opportunities are and we continue to do that because if, if there are opportunities to do it, we want to take advantage of it. But once again, we got to be smart and strategic about it. Yeah, I would, uh, I would echo what Daryl said. You know, we've worked with the city's economic development department for the last several weeks on the CARES Act and, you know, what kinds of funding is available to the CARES Act. Now, as a nonprofit, as Daryl mentioned, we can't apply on our own, but we can partner with the city. And really what a lot of that um, comes down to, and Daryl mentioned it, these grants are really to how do you open up private businesses to get back on their feet to spur the economy. It's not necessarily for, you know, a nonprofit that is, you know, through the city of Pasadena. So, you know, it's been difficult. Now, um, uh, our, our, our um, temporary care facility. Yeah, there's hopes, there's thoughts that the city is going to be building that back through somebody, whether it's FEMA, because I know around the country, I have a lot of friends at convention centers in Detroit and Baltimore and San Diego and in New York. And, you know, obviously those, all of that setup and all of that hospital information, you know, um, um, set up is going to be billed back to FEMA. So hopefully we'll see. All right. Well, and in building on all of that and kind of piggybacking off of all of the wonderful things that both of your organizations are doing uh, for the community right now, are there things that the community can do to to help uh, put you both in in both of your operations and in, on a better footing for when uh, things get back to normal? Are there things that, that the community can be doing now to help out? Well, from the tourism standpoint, you know, please go to the restaurants, order from the restaurants, order from the retail, you know, have visitors come in and stay at the hotels. But, but realistically, it's, it's, you know, shop and dine locally and, and Pasadena is open, um, you know, albeit though there are some restrictions. And the idea is, is let's, let's support all of our local businesses the best way that we can. And as events open up, whether it's us, the Rose Bowl, whether it's other, you know, museums, you know, come back out and support the folks that are here. I couldn't echo Mike's comments anymore. Um, he, he said it perfectly on the Rose Bowl side. If you want to learn how to play golf, we're open. Yeah. You come on down. You know, and it's beautiful, uh, of course, in great shape. And we also have a foundation, the Rose Bowl Legacy Foundation, that's been really successful. And has had an enormous amount of, of support from Pasadenans. So we would encourage you to help. Um, we're doing a campaign, uh, America Stadium Needs America's Help. And we do need help. And if some Pasadenans would consider supporting us, we'd be very grateful. All right. Uh, I uh, noticed that we do have another question uh, from someone uh, on the Facebook chat. And they were simply wondering when your facilities will be opening back up. Great question. And I wish I had super a question. All right. Yeah. <laughs> that is the $64 question. That is, you know, we, um, we, as Daryl mentioned earlier, you know, working with so many different associations and, you know, he, he's working with a whole stadium group, you know, on how facilities will open and when they will perhaps may uh, reopen. In our case, it's the same way. We're on a, a calls with a coalition of convention centers throughout California. And one of the things that, they're attempting to push is how do we get open in stage three? How do we get open in small, you know, smaller amounts, smaller amount of people, you know, how do we slowly get open so that we can build crowds? So, you know, the answer is uh, uh, we don't have an answer, but I think we're getting closer and closer to being able to be open for smaller type events come, you know, perhaps August, perhaps September, um, I mean, that would be that would be my best guess. All right. I know we're starting to run short on time, but there were a couple things. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Daryl. I don't mean to cut you off, but I know there were a couple other things that we really wanted to discuss. One of those, Daryl, is is Rose Bowl Live. And to that end, I believe we also have a, a short video that we are going to kind of throw to for a minute. You are looking live. 
there's something sacred about this stadium and its setting. There's nothing like this venue, in my opinion, in all of sports. The setting is about as good as anywhere in the country with the San Gabriel Mountains in the backdrop. It's always picturesque. We're going to play football. Happy Memorial Day weekend, everybody, and welcome back to Rose Bowl Live. As we celebrate together this holiday weekend, we want to start by remembering our fallen heroes in the military and acknowledge all that they have defended. Could you tell them a little bit about the Rose Bowl Live? Sure. No, it's been a, a great find and something, you know, you, you, during this, this situation, you know, there's always some things you don't expect some positives to come out of it, and that's one of them. I mentioned our foundation, Roseville Legacy Foundation, and it was really them with our marketing team. They wanted to do something just to try to, you want touch points. You want to, Mike talked about it earlier. You need to stay in touch with your customers and your folks. So we decided to let's do that and really to try for our donors, for our, our people who own tickets with us, our premium seat holders. And Deaton Brazino, who runs our foundations, I didn't realize that he is really also pretty adept at uh, you know playing uh, your role, Joe, a little bit. Uh, so we went in. We do have some pretty good contacts around the country. Uh, we reached out, and we've had four of them so far. They're pretty popular. It's just a way to keep people keep people engaged and keep the Rose Bowl at the forefront of people's mind. And we hopefully people are enjoying it. All right, that's wonderful. I would like to point out that the Rose Bowl Live runs both on the Municipal Access Station, which is K Pass, and also here on the Arroyo Channel. So keep your eyes open for that. Um, Mike, you have a, a program also that uh, we wanted to make sure we had an opportunity to discuss this evening, and that is Connect Pasadena. Now, my understanding with regards to this one is that we actually do have some video for that as well, and I think they'll be putting that up on the screen for our viewers at home while you talk about it. So if you wouldn't mind telling us a little bit about Connect Pasadena. Sure, thank you. Our uh, Convention and Visitors Bureau, along with... Uh, a number of other organizations, the city of Pasadena, the chamber, you know, we put together a virtual library that provides a variety of content for Pasadena's while you're staying at home. Um, it's entertaining, it's enlightening, and uh, Connect Pasadena features free content. And it, um, you know, when you, when you click on to each of the links, you can see a video library of, um, you know, categories such as uh, art and culture, fitness, uh, yoga, uh, children's activities, cooking, baking, and learning. So we're thrilled uh, that we were able to put that together. And uh, one other program we put together was Dine uh, and Shop Pasadena. And again, with the Chamber, it's uh, we published a, a citywide directory of restaurants and, and businesses that are offering um, uh, takeout service. All right. Um so now I have to ask, uh, there was discussion about uh, the cancellation of the Rose Bowl game and the Rose Parade. And I, I've heard reports that it was canceled. And then there were reports that it was being discussed uh, as if there hasn't been an official decree one way or the other. But in the event that those events were to be postponed as a result of the pandemic, how, how would that affect each of your organizations? We don't like to think about that because, uh, you know, purely that's you pass the end revolves around not just us. Uh, the entire city revolves around January 1st. As we all know who live here, there is nothing like January 1st in Pasadena, nothing like it anywhere. So let's just hope that things can turn around and there's a way that those incredible events can still occur. Yeah, I would. Uh, Your love for the city is, is very evident in every response. I'm sorry, Mike, I didn't mean to cut you off there. <laughs> no, that's fine. I, uh, I agree with Daryl. You know, let, let's not think about it at this point. I'm optimistic. I think that we're going to have a fabulous New Year's Day. Uh, I'm very optimistic about it because, you know, thinking of the downside means that we're exactly where we're at today without activities without restaurants full, without shops full, without hotels full. So we are optimistic that things are going to move forward on January 1st. And, you know, we're going to be the center of the, uh, the country and the world come uh, early morning for the parade and then have a fabulous uh, 
uh, playoff game this year. Well, Pasadena has certainly worked worked very hard o- across the years to cultivate uh, its its place as as a world class city, and uh, certainly Pasadenians are resilient. And I know that the city is going to thrive, uh, especially when things can return to normal. We have just about reached the close of our show this evening, and I wanted to make sure that each of you gentlemen had a minute to to uh, talk about any final thoughts or, or words that you might like to uh, say before the close of the show. And um, Mike, I think if you wouldn't mind, we're going to have you go first on this. Absolutely. You know, um, it's been a t- it's been a tough time. We all know that. And we've still got several weeks, months through this crisis, and we will survive. We'll be stronger when we return. We're going to have, I know from our business standpoint, the Rose Bowl, people want to be here. People want to be in Pasadena. They want to shop. They want to dine. They want to come to games. They want to come to conventions. And Pasadena will be fine. We just have to weather this storm, stay together, work hard, and in the end, we'll we'll bounce back uh, as strong as ever. All right. Uh, Daryl, if you uh, wouldn't mind, you have about uh, 60 seconds also to, to uh, give us your thoughts. All right. Okay, great. You know, Mike summed it up wonderfully. You know, Pasadena is a very, very proud place. People love Pasadena. It's unlike any other community in, in Southern California. It has great roots. It has, people are so passionate about it and it makes it a very special city and a very special place to live and to work. And the culture here is second to none. And that's not going to change. As we, as Mike mentioned, we just have to weather the storm. We're in a storm. We all know we are. And we're just going to make the best of it all we can and get on the other side. And we're going to be at the end of the day, we're all going to be stronger and we're going to be better. And you know, we're going to be more sanitized, right? <laughs> we're going to um, take all the other measures and yes. we're going to do things and be better at the end of the day. And we'll be all right. We're going to get through this. I think those are definitely uh, words to live by. Mr. Daryl Dunn and Mr. Mike Ross, thank you both so much for joining us this evening. And certainly for all that you and your organizations are doing for the community, uh, not only today, but uh, year round every year. Uh, and again, it's been a pleasure speaking with you both this evening. So thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, for the viewers at home, if there are topics that you would like to see addressed in our discussions, you can email them to us at arroyolive at pasadenamedia.org. That's arroyolive at pasadenamedia.org. And we will try and include them in a future broadcast. Thank you for watching Arroyo Live. I am Joe Carbonetta. Have a wonderful evening.